afternoon and good evening to all the speaker, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the SNS webinar. The speaker for the first session today is our honorable guest from Denmark, Professor Thorstein Meilin. Professor Meilin is the head of the Department of Neurosurgery at the National Hospital Denmark Copenhagen. He previously served as Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Geneva, Switzerland, and Senior Advisor at the Besta Neurosim Center at the Instituto uh, Nacional uh, Neurological in Milano, Italy. His clinical interests include cerebral vascular surgery, skull-based surgery, orbital tumors, and cranial pharyngioma. He has published more than 250 peer-reviewed scientific articles and book chapters, presented more than 400 lectures at the international meetings and courses, and participated in the organization of more than 110 congresses, postgraduate training, and hands-on courses. Uh, Professor Meiling is currently editor of the Neurosurgical Review and editor member of the Brain and Spine, Hekta Neurochirurgica, and also Neurochirurgia. And he's also a member of Academy of Neurosurgery and World Academy of Neurosurgery and honorable member of several national neurosurgical uh, societies. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to be our speaker for our webinar today. And he'll be talking about unusual aneurysm, what should we know? The second speaker for, for the day today is our guest from China, Professor Shi Zifeng. Professor Zifeng is an associate professor at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Huasan Hospital for Dan University, Shanghai, China. He did his fellowship at the Department of Anatomical and Cellular Pathology, the Chinese University of Hong Kong for Glioma Research. He also finished Global Clinical Scholar Research Training Program in Harvard Medical School. Dr. Shi is the Vice Director of Molecular Laboratory of the Neurosurgical Institute of Wudan University, a General Secretary of Neuro-Oncology Commission of Shanghai Anti-Cancer Association, a committee member of Society for Neuro-Oncology of China, a youth committee member of Tumor Society of Shanghai Medical Association. We are extremely honored to him today at our webinar today, and he'll be talking about molecular biomarkers in adult diffuse glioma from diagnosis to surgery, surgical navigation. The chair for the first session today is our distinguished faculty from Japan, Professor Na Naki Otani. Professor Otani is the professor of neurosurgery at the Department of Neurological Surgery, at Nihon University School of Medicine, Tokyo, Japan. He's an expert in the field of cerebral vascular surgery. He has published several publications in various peer review journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the, the first session of the today webinar. The chair for the second session of today webinar is our honored guest from the United States of America, Professor Alizera Mansori. Professor Mansori is an associate professor in the Department of the Neurosurgical at Penn State Cancer Institute, Pennsylvania, United States of America. His clinical interests are focused upon brain cancer trials, surgery of brain tumors, and epilepsy surgery. He's Literate contributes uh, sum up a score of international publication and book chapters. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Yukato, I would like to welcome both our speaker and chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of SNS webinar. A warm welcome to our colleague in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Naki Otani. Professor Otani. So uh, nice to see you, uh, Professor Meiling. So I'm looking uh, forward to seeing you. So uh, today, uh, so entitled Unusual Aneurysms, what we need to know. So unusual aneurysms, uh, as far as I can think of, I mean, I see anterior wall dissecting on the thrombotic giant and deep seated aneurysms, but uh, which usually needs uh, skull base and bypass techniques. So uh, in my center, uh, the uh, I, so uh, endovascular treatment uh, may be the first choice for the simple aneurysms, but uh, so direct clipping is very hard uh, uh, for the aneurysm, which uh, can not be treat treated uh, with uh, IVR treatment. So I'm so uh, let's 
So I know the Professor Mering is a famous uh, familiar with uh, aneurysmal treatment and the di diagnosis and uh, endovascular and uh, direct clipping for these aneurysmal treatments. So I'm looking forward to the, this uh, lecture. So please, uh, let's get started uh, your lectures. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation and thank you for uh, the kind introduction. So I will... <coughs> As you mentioned, I talk about unusual aneurysms, and um, I would try to keep it fairly simple and um, some take-home messages for, let's say, residents and, and, and junior faculty. Uh, I'd like to give an overview of uh, certain aneurysms. This is my current workplace uh, where I'm actually sitting now. Uh, it's a beautiful new hospital um, in Copenhagen. <clears throat> you mentioned several. Uh, I would like to discuss the fusiform, the mycotic, um, the blist aneurysms, and the giant. I will not deal with pediatric. For the giants, I will uh, demonstrate two uh, completely different techniques um, to deal with, with some surgical videos, and the rest will be more, let's say, theoretical. But again, uh, very basic and then we can have a discussion afterwards. With respect to fusiform aneurysms, we know uh, well about them, and they are often occur, for instance, in the basilar artery. Um, as opposed to sacral aneurysms, they are uh, circumferential, uh, meaning that they involve 360 of the vessel wall. We can differentiate between the subintimal dissection that typically results in a luminal stenosis because you have a thrombus formation inside the arterial wall, development of thromboembolic um, events and cerebral infarct. On the other hand, you have the subadventitial dissection, which typically uh, leads to pseudoaneurysm formation. And of course, these aneurysms are fragile and can rupture and cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, typical angiography like this. And again, we can see that it uh, more or less involves 360 uh, of, the, of the arterial wall. And you can appreciate that this is the basilar uh, involving um, uh, the, the circumference. Uh, to summarize a few characteristics, uh, they are typically a non-branching sites. Of course, there can be perforators uh, coming off, um, but no major um, branches. Then you would more often have sacral aneurysms. <clears throat> they can involve the adventitia or the lamina muscular layer. They're often large. By the time they are diagnosed, uh, the form is uh, obviously fusiform, and there is no neck. Men tend to be more affected than women, and uh, patients are typically younger than for sacular aneurysms. They can present with mass effect ischemia uh, rare, uh, and sometimes subarachnoid hemorrhage, but the, the former presentation is probably more prevalent. Uh, and with respect to tendency to grow, it is a high risk. If we move on to mycotic aneurysms, Again, compared to sacral aneurysms, the mycotic aneurysms also tend to involve more or less the whole circumference, uh, or at least the majority thereof, um, and they are often distal. Um, they can present with subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hematoma or the combination of, of, of both. At least in our population, we see a lot of uh, Staph aureus and, uh, and uh, Streptococcus viridans or gram negative bacteria. Uh, we should identify and treat the underlying uh, infection early on. We see it uh, often from the, the teeth. So often we ask for um, a dentist or a max fax to review the patient. ENT, if it's cyanogenic from the air sinuses. And of course, we need to uh, always keep in mind mycotic um, uh, emboli from, from a valve, a cardiac valve problem. 
which is why we should uh, ask our cardiologist for uh, input and have an echo, etc. Rule out endocarditis. Um, they, as I said, they are often distal. They can be quite large uh, as compared to the tiny artery that they arise from. Um, again, some characteristics. Um, the aneurysm wall is, is thin, often adventitia, often uh, fibrogenogen, and very fragile. They're, um, they can be small, uh, but they can also be quite large, uh, or at least you know they, they're small, but relative to the parent artery, they are quite large. Um, the shape can be circular, irregular, or dome-shaped. The neck is typically wide and poorly uh, defined. Again, we have a predilection in men, and we have a predilection in younger patients compared to sacular aneurysms. They present with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they have a high tendency to grow. Moving on to blister aneurysms, um, again, compared to sacular aneurysms, we have the, um, the aneurysm wall. In blister aneurysms, we don't really have a wall. We just have this uh, adventitia and fibrinogen on the outside, almost um, like a crust covering uh, a rupture site in the arterial wall. So there is no intima and there is no uh, muscularis in this. Um, again, they're also a non-branching site or parent vessel. Um, they are rare, uh, but in the carotid uh, ICA, uh, they are most frequent. Um, I have published some uh, three, four papers uh, on, on this. You have the QR codes here if you want to... Um, to uh, look further into these, uh, some are reviews art review articles and some are more clinical outcome articles. Um, <clears throat> they typically on the anterior medial wall of the supraclinoid ICA, they should not be branches coming off. Then there would be anterior choroidal or PCOM or something like this. But here you can see there's no branch here. Here is the ophthalmic. There should not be any branches coming off and still you have the bulge. Um, Another one, almost like a bowler hat, uh, which is uh, also a telltale, telltale sign. Um, they are not typically mo uh, multilobular, but one bowler hat shaped. Um, again, these are different examples. Here is, is um, a different shape, more pointed. But again, uh, on the top of the carotid, pointing upwards, um, no branches. I mentioned they are most common in anterior carotid artery. So you can see here, this is, uh, this is a breakdown. They can occur elsewhere, but these are rare. So the most important thing to remember is carotid, non-branching site, um, and, and a tiny aneurysm should raise suspicion. Proximal thin layer of adventitia, as I mentioned, they are small, conical, or this um, uh, pointed or dome-shaped. The wide the neck and poorly defined. These are much more common in women than in men, as opposed to the two other we have seen. Patients are younger, typically, than sacular. Presentation is subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they have a tendency to grow. These are very fragile and, and unstable aneurysms that need to be dealt with very carefully. Um, but this is not the topic of my uh, my presentation now, so I will not uh, discuss surgical treatment or endovascular treatment for that matter of, of the blisters. Here you have um, uh, the comparison uh, along these uh, parameters that we have discussed, the fusiform, the blister, and the mycotic. Um, they all tend to be younger than the sacular, and they have um, a, a predilection uh, the fusiform and the posterior circulation, the blisters and mycotics tend to be anterior circulation. Um, they all have a high tendency uh, to grow and to present with hemorrhage. Uh, and the treatment for fusiform is probably endovascular is better than surgery to fill in uh, and recreate a new uh, lumen for the blisters studies and, and, and review uh, papers uh, tend to um, 
uh, have equipoise or surgery seems to be um, as efficient as endovascular and with better results uh, in the long term. Um, but of course, with the slightly higher uh, treatment risk, whereas mycotic aneurysms um, is, of course, a surgical disease because that vessel wall or the mycotic part um, is often um, uh, not available to, to put another foreign body um, inside the lumen. Um, I will move on to uh, the giant aneurysms and and. As I said, show uh, two examples of, of treatment strategies. They are, as we know, per definition, more than 25 millimeters. Uh, they're also rare. Uh, they can be fusiform or saccular. Uh, they're very often partially thrombosed, and they're very often partially calcified. Uh, and of course, given the size, uh, they tend to have uh, vessels coming off, either the neck or even the aneurysm sac. So therefore, they are complex to deal with. In terms of, of rupture uh, risks, um, we have uh, two classic papers studying this. Uh, Isuya, as uh, seen here from Lancet 2003, you can see uh, in black here, you can see the risk of rupture for giant aneurysms, which is way, way higher than for, for large uh, aneurysms. And similar here, uh, the UCA study from New England in 2012, you can see uh, the risk of rupture after years of diagnosis for a giant aneurysm here shown in red. So ne ne these needs to be um, need to be dealt with. In terms of therapy, um, we can have a conservative surgical or endovascular um, conservative uh, treatment um, it's typically not a, a good option because they tend to grow and, and, and rupture, as we have seen. Uh, endovascular is improving, but for now, uh, the most uh, well-documented uh, treatment will be surgery. With surgery, we can differentiate between a direct approach and an indirect approach. Um, this is courtesy from Peter Vaikotsi. Um, the slide and, and the direct approach would be direct attack and the other one he calls no touch. So basically uh, parent artery occlusion with or without bypass. And there are some factors uh, that um, indicates that the direct or the indirect technique is, is preferable. The direct techniques typically involve a suction decompression. So we can trap the aneurysm, puncture the aneurysm and suck out the blood and then reconstruct. And this is um, a very good approach if you don't have a lot of calcifications and of course, if you don't have thrombi. If the giant aneurysm is uh, thrombosed or a large part is thrombosed, then with the direct technique, you need to open the aneurysm, of course, um, uh, remove the, the thrombus inside and put the temporary clip to trap the aneurysm once it starts to bleed and then cut out the aneurysm and reconstruct um, the, the wall. Um, a direct technique may also be aneurysmal excision and then uh, reanastomosis, for instance, uh, of the two vessel stumps. Um, and then again, this is um, courtesy of, of Peter. You can see here clip reconstruction, mostly uh, for sacular giant with the defined narrow neck and without too much uh, calcification and, and thrombi. Once we have more thrombi, once we have more fusiform, uh, or once we have previously treated aneurysm, uh, aneurysm with uh, be it um, coils or flow diverters or web devices, then they become less and less uh, amenable to clip reconstruction and will need perhaps uh, an exclusion with the bypass strategy. 
uh, as I mentioned, rare aneurysms in pediatrics, I will not discuss. So I move on now to um, the two cases as promised. So we keep um, it interesting. This is a 59 year old gentleman with a past history, uh, which is quite typical, diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, renal dysfunction. And he presented with increasing headaches and eventually complex epileptic seizures. And here we can see um, the pre-op image. You can see uh, aneurysm here on the left side of the MCA, uh, significant edema probably causing his seizures and causing mass effect. Um, there's a T2 and you can appreciate the same thing. Aneurysm was, was large. <clears throat> here we have the angiography, ICA coming up, A1, M1, and here branches coming off uh, the aneurysm sac. This is the circulated part, but of course the aneurysm sac with the thrombus is much, much larger. And here we have two um, options. We have the direct uh, clipping reconstruction as previously discussed, or we can uh, also discuss a bypass strategy. Um, given the number of branches here, uh, my choice was to um, go for a direct uh, clipping. So I will show uh, how I do it. Uh, Prontotemporal craniotomy, standard, nothing fancy. Uh, let's see if this is running. So <clears throat> here we are on the left side. We're just opening up um, to release the, the frontal lobe to have more working space. Uh, you can appreciate that that was the ipsy um, uh, optic nerve. On the other side, it was the contralateral. Now there's the anterior clinal process and, the, of course, ICA coming up. So we just do our sharp dissection to get uh, more, more space, get proximal control, taking care of um, the tiny branches to... Um, and get some CSF to go down to uh, Lilliquist membrane. Now we can open up the sylvian fissure. You can see here uh, hemosiderin uh, discoloration. Um, the, the fissure was quite uh, tight because of uh, the inflammatory reactions around that we often see around these giant aneurysms. Uh, but taking our time um, is, of course, sped up a bit using water dissection to to um, uh, to open up the <coughs> the sylvian fissure continue with our um, sharp opening and eventually we will um, visualize the um, uh, the distal branches the uh, the proximal here is aneurysm sac again we can use water dissection to to develop a cleavage plane a branch in the wall um, that we also can um, mobilized, take off from the wall using sharp dissection. Um, this is not the most important part of it, uh, of, of the video, but of course it's important for um, uh, the integrity of, of, the, um, uh, of the brain to preserve all these vessels. So this is the, um, the artery, uh, no, aneurysm now. Now we can put a temporary clip on proximally uh, and then we do a trapping. So we put temporary clips on the two distal uh, branches. Uh, now the aneurysm is trapped. We have burst suppression um, and we can open the aneurysm, use the CUSA to quickly debulk it. Um, I like to stay below five minutes of temporary clipping like this with the, with the um, uh, to, to avoid ischemic damages. So you will see um, we remove parts of the thrombus. And once the clock is here, we can see the ostia and we rinse with saline with heparin. Now we can look better behind the aneurysm wall. We can dissect here. If we need the reperfusion, we can close this off. Uh, you will see later. So we, um, we have a bit more 
more time here. I did not finish. I could not finish my complete um, dissection of the sac. So therefore, we come in with these giant clips to close it uh, to have a temporary closure of the aneurysm. And then we can reperfuse. So now we are taking off the temporary clips. We do reperfusion of, of the brain once we have um, reduction of, of the um, uh, electrophysiological monitoring. Now we can reperfuse for however long <coughs> um, just to avoid any, any, any bleeding. Here there was a bleeding, um, so we put another clip and remove again the, the temporary. And now we <coughs> reperfuse, we wait. We can uh, look at different treatment strategies. We can do our Doppler or flow measurements. So we know that the um, distal branches are, uh, are open. Here I'm, whilst I'm waiting, um, doing a bit more uh, aneurysmal raffi. So we basically cut out part of the wall to make it smaller because we don't need all this wall to, to reconstruct. Um, so this just to reduce the bulk of the, of the tissue that we have to deal with to have a cleaner picture. Uh, we can continue to detach the aneurysm wall from the surrounding parenchyma or to um, um, or make sure that we see all the, all the, all the branches so we don't catch uh, small branches with our uh, rather large clips, as you could see, um, uh, just to, you may need a lot of force. Now we've continued our preparation <coughs> um, and we're ready for, so these are, should be considered as, as pilot clips, right? We again put our temporary clips on uh, to trap this aneurysm. We can remove or we'll uh, go ahead and remove these giant clips. Uh, of course, taking care of the intima inside the aneurysm. Uh, use heparin saline uh, to irrigate to avoid any uh, emboli uh, shooting off. And often we, um, we can... Uh, let it uh, let it bleed a bit, um, so we have the distal trapping, and and just let let up a bit um, the inflow, if there should be any thrombi in the in the inflow zone. But here you can see we we can we can clean up. Um, apologize for the speed. Uh, this is uh, sped up for for the sake of our time. But you can see here the ostia um, uh, coming coming into view and similar to a carotid uh, in the neck, for instance, sometimes there are thrombi that needs to be more uh, manually manipulated. Um, obviously patient needs um, some anticoagulation uh, afterwards, but that is similar to, um, to a bypass. So um, the, the anticoagulation regime is not that dissimilar to, to a bypass case, for instance. And now we have a much smaller aneurysmal sac, as you can appreciate. We could place our clips. <coughs> um, uh, take care not to be too aggressive towards um, the inflow zones. You could see some calcification, so we don't want to compromise um, flow here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, they're coming off the temporary clips. We can do um, our Doppler measurements. Um, I tend to do a Doppler immediately uh, because it's so quick, and then uh, we do the ICG. <coughs> um, here, I was a bit too close to the inflow. Um, um, so I just moved it a bit more distal. You just try to get um, as much neck as possible uh, in your clips without compromising flow. Here again, I'm not very happy with this, so I, I uh, 
replace it a bit to have a bit more space inside this uh, sack here. We have a better Doppler signal. And then um, we do our ICG <coughs> and showing uh, that the branches are open. Um, so this is an example of, um, of the direct technique. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> um, yeah, there was just a, the post op. There was no um, ischemic events, and and uh, it was quite uneventful recovery. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> this is the CTA uh, post. A lot of artifacts, of course. The most important thing is that you can see the branches distally are nice and open, and no embolic events. Um, then we can move on to the second case. Um, this is a young man presented with with the um, headaches. He was also a psychiatric patient patient um, with some schizophrenia, which is probably why no one paid attention to his headache. And uh, you can appreciate here this is a rather large aneurysm. Uh, the white eye here is the circulated part, and this whole thing here is the thrombos. So of course uh, it's a massive. Um, or the mass effect that is significant and we need to reduce this volume. Uh, here again, we have the CTA and this is um, uh, basically inside the circulated part, almost like an artery inside um, the aneurysm. Uh, here, the thing is that the angular artery came off the sac and to the um, this was left side, uh, but th this was uh, nourishing um, both parts of the motor cortex and the speech area. <clears throat> and you can see here the angiography, and uh, we need to preserve uh, these branches. Uh, so what we did here, this is the stump coming off the aneurysm. So this is very superficial. We have our STA prepared here. Um, I sacrificed this uh, this artery. This is to the speech area, um, and this to the motor cortex um, here. So we can cut this off. <coughs> um, leaves us with a very short stump. Uh, we clean this up. Uh, I like the use of color to just see the walls better. Um, we prepare the the, um, the walls and then we do uh, end to end with the STA to preserve these two branches coming off. Then we have um, managed to uh, keep the our perfusion of of the brain. The aneurysm has no outflow and will the last part will thrombose um, and we can, uh, then go in and excise uh, at least the interior of the aneurysm uh, to reduce the mass effect. I tend to be a bit careful with a very aggressive dissection of the aneurysm wall um, because as we saw, especially in the first case, there is a strong inflammatory reaction around it. So um, you can easily damage uh, the, even the pile surface uh, on the brain so if you pull too much or you don't have a, a good um, plane, it's better to leave some uh, aneurysm sac uh, behind, but you empty the interior uh, to avoid uh, cortical damage. Uh, especially here, of course, uh, we also give some anticoagulation and um, uh, that will increase the risk of of uh, hemorrhagic transformation if you have too much um, uh, bleeding uh, or uh, co damage to the cortex. So here we have our STA. Um, we're happy with with our, our suture line. So we can uh, uh, release our, our clips uh, and have this uh, nicely perfused <coughs> post-op yeah he had no um 
change the motor function nor a speech function. Um, and as I said, the aneurysm, of course, is, is excluded. We released the uh, last clip from the STA, <clears throat> and we have a nice pulsation and we have a nice flow. Um, this instance, I used the flow meter, and we can um, also verify, of course, with the with the angiography or the um, uh, fluorescence. Um, I think that's uh, it for me now, and then I'm happy to have a discussion with the uh, with the moderator or take some questions. Uh, thank you, Professor. So it's a nice presentation and showing you uh, excellent techniques. Some question and comment and from the audience. Any question? May I ask two questions, Professor? Ah, Professor Liu, please. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mei Ling, for a very nice uh, presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one regarding the uh, water dissection. Uh, may I know what instrument that you use? Do you use a syringe? Or what's the size of syringe and how much pressure that you apply to ensure it won't cause any damage and a good dissection? My second question, Professor, uh, regarding you say your temporary clamping time is five minutes. Uh, may I know that reperfusion time, how long will you wait? Uh, in my center, usually we wait for five minutes be be in between. So what's your usual practice? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, so um, for the water dissection, I have nothing um, particular fancy. Um, I know my, my friend Rukuya has a, a beautiful Japanese uh, uh, instrument that is both uh, irrigating and, and suction device. I've tried it and I find it a bit heavy. Um, so I I'm, 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 have not used it um, or taken up using it. Um, so I will use a regular syringe with the, with the, blunt, uh, with the blunt tip. And in terms of, of pressure, it's I don't know experience. There, there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing uh, fancy going on. I like to see um, the 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 arachnoid blow up a bit. Uh, I use the same for for ruptured aneurysms, for instance. Um, I tell my 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 trainees also. You know, the, my concept of, of ruptured is basically to convert it to unruptured aneurysm, and that you do by removing the blood then it's the same thing. Uh, yes, there is a higher risk of intraoperative rupture, but all the other maneuvers are exactly the same. Um, so water is a good thing. Uh, and, and keep it clean, uh, not only for washing, but as I said, the, the, the dissection is very, very useful and probably underused. Um, in terms of reperfusion, I am also using uh, the 5 plus 5. Uh, now, more and more probably neurophysiology monitored. Um, so if we have a good monitoring, um, uh, you know, branches going to the motor cortex, for instance, where you have reliable monitoring, I will push it. Um, but if I've done seven, eight minutes, uh, I will stop regardless of the neurophysiology. So I'm a bit old school. Uh, I don't have the complete trust in, in this, I have to say. Uh, and five minutes reperfusion. Um, another interesting observation is more related to our cognition, I guess. The five minutes you have occlusion for dissection is very quick. And the five minutes that you have to wait for reperfusion takes very, very long. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's difficult to wait more than five minutes. But um, again, probably tailored to neurophysiology. Uh, if you have complete trust or faith in it, uh, I don't yet. So I keep five plus five. I think that's a good uh, rule of thumb and easy to remember. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the online question is one. Uh, so, Dr. Maturia. I'm Dr. Maturia. I was Maturia. working in PGI Chandigarh, and uh, then in 1992, I was with Professor Sugita for uh, two, three months. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, Professor Trostin, it's an excellent demonstration of two unusual techniques. I congratulate you for that. And uh, there are two questions and two, three comments. The question is, how you deal with the fungal aneurysms? Yeah, do you take one question at the time? Well, um, fungal aneurysms, typically excision. They're so distal that... Um, 
uh, if there's a big branch, I will excise the segment and then do end to end. If it's a tiny branch, I would just cut out uh, the, the segment. And if you have a small uh, cortical ischemia, um, yeah, I would not be too concerned, to be honest. Typically, you have, if they're very distal on the cortical surface, you will have enough collateral to have a non-existent or very, very uh, minor uh, the cortical um, uh, ischemia, uh, ischemic uh, volume. Uh, say when you have partially uh, removed the thrombus and removed the temporary clip for the reperfusion yeah. and put up those uh, big clips on the aneurysm wall, did, uh, did you ever see the distal embolization in these patients? Because we, no. we, we can't give a systemic uh, heparin. It's not possible. So no. did you ever see that? No. I uh, might have been lucky, but um, uh, I have not. Um, you need to you need to um, to to rinse and to pay attention to the infraluminal and and rinse very carefully with, as I said, with the heparin uh, saline. I inspect the ostia, uh, and and I have yeah, call me lucky. I'm I'm not actually. Uh, there there is a bit hypothetical question. Please don't mind if it is. it looks ex absurd a little. See, the thing is that many a times when you are removing the clot from inside, we have to do it two, three times. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it possible that uh, we have a temporary clip ready, that it is not occluding the vessel? When we are removing the clot, the time we reach the ostia of the vessel, then only this temporary clip is applied. So we reduce the temporary clipping time so as yes. to have the proper perfusion. What are your comments on that? Yeah, no, no I agree. I, uh, I often uh, do that as well. It depends. Sometimes, <laughs> some days I will feel braver and sometimes I am more defensive. So I don't have a, a, a system. Uh, perhaps I should elevate it to a gut feeling. But absolutely, um, it brings more drama to to um, to resect the thrombus, uh, and then the, you uh, have the red uh, fountain, uh, the uh, Fontaine uh, Rouge uh, coming out you, and then you put the temporary clip. The whole field is messy. Um, so, uh, if I think I can get away with uh, removing the the thrombus without uh, this this bleeding, I prefer so, because it's just a clean uh, surgical field. Actually, the thing is that uh, now the vascular neurosurgeons in Japan, they should come come out with some more innovations on Professor Sugita's temporary clips. So yeah. uh, you will be able to place that. See, the, uh, there are two comments I wanted to make about the same, the giant aneurysms with the thick wall. Many a times you, you are these big master clips are inadequate to occlude the wall. If you, if you go, go back into the literature, Professor Jua Harnesnini, mm -hmm. he introduced a clip which was Beckett, Beckett's detachable clips. The Beckett's clamps which are being used by the cardiovascular surgeons, mm -hmm. he prepared a Beckett's detachable clamp. So what happens that the clipping portion gets detached, the handle gets removed, and that clip stays there for some time on the thick wall. Mm. Once we have the reperfusion, after that, we can put the clamp again and take it out. Whether taking out is possible or not, after detachment, I am not sure. But that is one technique which could be possible. So uh, we can do that. That is uh, one thing which is possible. Then no, about I've, the... I've, yes, I've, please I've seen him. Yeah, I've seen uh, Yuha uh, do this. And... Um, uh, but it's it's often to break down heavily calcified aneurysms. Yes, yes. That's true. Yes. Um, then I would be more concerned about thrombus formation, to be honest, than a soft thrombus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one comment about the blister aneurysms. Yeah. Say the blister. Uh, the first is question: Why the blister aneurysms are common only in internal carotid and not in the other vessels? Why it is so? then we probably need uh, a flow expert to to tell us it's probably the wall stress 
of of uh, that part of the carotid. Um, oh, really? They tend to be more common in females, so it likely has to do with the collagen. Uh, they're more common on the right than on the left side, mm -hmm. uh, for instance. So there are some peculiarities. Um, on the right side may also have to do with, with um, uh, let's say, the direct blood coming up uh, directly from the heart and not... Uh, <laughs> on the left side that's purely speculation but but they um uh, certainly related to flow dynamics sorry and, i'll and take uh, uh, i'll take uh, one more comment say about the blister aneurysms what one can do is we can put a cotton on that and we put the cotton and on the cotton on the cotton, we put a clip. Yeah, the, the, of course, you have, um, in with respect to surgery, you have the option of direct clipping. Mm -hmm. um, it's highly risky, uh, but some have, have done it, around 50% of, of their clips. I think uh, Michael Lawton. From okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. If, if I, let, let, let me finish with the, yeah. So yeah, Yes, uh, please, go ahead. The, 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 the cotton, I personally have used the Gore-Tex. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one personal disaster, uh, which led me to to really rethink, um, you know, how we deal with these blisters. Uh, and the next one that came, I used um, a thin Gore-Tex from the cardiac uh, pediatric surgeons. So this was zero point three millimeters, mm -hmm. because the normal Gore-Tex you can have a dura or whatever is way way too thick. Uh, but this is very uh, easy to maneuver, and it gives more, let's say, a rigid uh, external uh, support. My concern has been with cotton is that it, it, you know, it's flexible, so I'm not entirely convinced that that is as safe as a more external rigid, um, uh, yeah, support of the of the wall. So I basically put the sling. And and uh, reinforce it with the with the clip. Um, There's one other publication I mentioned. In Japan, the people put more uh, bio bond or something. Is there a role of putting the bio bond on the? You people are quite fancy on putting that. I, I'm not sure, but the the Japanese, uh, at least the published series, they tend now to um, if they do surgery, they tend now to. Uh, use a lot of protective bypass. Mm -hmm. And if they have to sacrifice the ICA, they keep the bypass open. Obviously, but they yes, have the bypass it. running whilst they have um, a temporary occlusion of the ICA with the distal protection. And then you can place safely put the clip or, or dissect the aneurysm uh, or inspect the hole and, and some have sutured also um, to repair. Thank you very much for tolerating me for a longer time. And thanks to the chair people and to the speaker. And it's a great uh, teaching to everyone on the forum. Please. Uh, okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you, doctor. So uh, one, one question. Can I, can, I, can I make one question? To me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, look, yeah, I, sure, I see sure. a hand to, to yeah, the yeah. left. Uh, Joe E. Sam also, I see, has yeah. raised his hand. So... Uh, for the anterior wall aneurysms, an yes. aneurysms so uh, which classified as a clippable type or the unclippable type blood blister like aneurysms, did you, did you, how did you distinguish, distinguish with these clippable or the non clippable uh, or I, the radiographical findings? Or the, um, I don't, you know, to be honest, uh, most of the blister aneurysms operated, uh, they have an extreme high risk of intraoperative rupture, even in the best of hands. I think Spetzler had two thirds or something. I think the most common is that you fail to identify it as blister before you operate. So you do your regular dissection, you think you have a sacral aneurysm, and then boom. Um, if you have your clinical suspicion, uh, I think you you take more care, and if you can have a temporary clip, uh, obviously proximal to it, then you can have uh, and uh, well, 
arterial wall reconstruction because it's not really yeah. clipping the aneurysm. It's more that you have to adapt the two healthy or you, you need to catch healthy parts of the aneurysm wall and reconstruct the lumen. Um, uh, but often they are so proximal that you don't really have, you, you will have your, your um, um, distal dural ring in the way. So once you have your temporary clip, you don't really have much space to, to put um, your permanent clip and get this vessel reconstruction. Um, often there will be tiny perforators coming off on the back wall, uh, preventing the use of a Sund clip. Uh, you know, the encircler and force clip uh, because you would sacrifice um, the, the, the tiny vessels. That's the beauty of using the Gore-Tex, for instance, because then you can adapt it and, and wrap it uh, so that you, you, you reinforce the, the wall exterior, but you allow perfusion of these uh, perforators. Uh, but there's no way of angiography to tell beforehand, not not in my eyes, at least. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, uh, uh, Anza, any question? Okay. Are there, uh, say, the, the, there are some studies which have been done by Professor Yoko Kato. He had, she had been working quite a lot on the uh, uh, unruptured aneurysm and uh, there are lots of uh, biochemical, biomaterial things which were being done by her. Uh, maybe that we can ask her that is it possible to predict that this is a uh, blister aneurysm which probably will be able to tackle by clipping and this wall will be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Probably she may, uh, you, you can ask this from her and she will be able to predict those things and uh, maybe. Should we, I, I see a raised hand uh, from Joe E. Sam. Should we allow him to? Hi, Prof. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It was a very excellent lecture. Thank you for the two cases. I have two questions, if you would allow. Uh, first is, you mentioned that uh, you had burst suppression for one of the cases. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, as in what drugs did you use and how did you measure that? And uh, do you have any experience uh, in dolicoactactic vertebral bacilli fusiform aneurysms causing mainly compressive symptoms on the brainstem. Uh, what are your mm. uh, views on, on this kind of uh, uh, fusiform aneurysms? How, how do you think it best approach them by endovascular or by microsurgical yeah. techniques? Thanks. Yeah, so the burst of, so one fairly easy and one <laughs> impossible question close to. So the burst suppression, um, uh, is basically uh, neurophysiological monitoring. Uh, uh, it, there's nothing fancy. You just increase a bit uh, the, more the propofol um, anesthesia. Uh, I don't do um, barbiturates, for instance. You can achieve the same with uh, with the propofol, um, just to uh, lower the uh, the oxygen requirements of the brain. I, I s still uh, believe it um, it helps. Um, or buys you some some time. I don't really cool patients, for instance, it may drop to you know 36 or high 35 uh, degrees Celsius, um, but not active cooling. Um, Dolgoek does is yes, I do have experiences, but mostly uh, bad ones, uh, terrible diseases, um, very difficult to treat. Sometimes. Uh, they are amenable to some sort of flow diversion, but the long-term results are, are, are not that uh, good. We tended to call them the, the neurovascular ALS uh, because they, whatever you do, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to, to, to treat. Um, seems that they often have uh, miss at least one PCOM um, so, uh, of course, the obvious uh, thing would, would, would be to do bilateral uh, vertebral artery occlusion and flow reversal that would lower the, the, the pressure. And if, you, if they do tolerate it, um, uh, I think that's uh, probably the least invasive uh, measure. And, and we have, we've done that. Uh, if they have at least one peak, that can carry the posterior circulation. Um, 
uh, we have in the past also uh, done PCOM reconstruction with with bypass. I've never had any great success with it. Um, I know Rukuya and, and Michael Lawton, for instance, have, um, but that often is is very difficult bypass surgery. Um, so I don't have a magic wand for for these. They're very very difficult patients. These are really very very difficult patients, both for the neurosurgeons and the endovascular people. We can get away with the endovascular techniques for quite long time. But subsequently, sometimes these continue to grow and continue to have problems. And that, as Joe has put up, Joe has put up the question of pressing the brain stem, that situation many a times come and you have to go in. And still, I don't know whether these are forgiving us or not. I'm not very sure. It's a really very, very tough aneurysms any neurosurgeons can face. Thanks, Prof. Materia, and thanks, Prof. Thank you. Okay. Nice. Good. So we're on time, I think. Okay. I will leave you guys to it. Thank you for your questions, and again, thank you for inviting. Me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, can, can we hear some concluding remarks, uh, uh, comment from Professor Otani, Professor? Yeah. Yeah. So today the we yes. can get so many information. The, uh, on unusual aneurysm through the lectures by Professor Mary Maring. So we are so glad many uh, audience can use these uh, knowledge for medical treatment from tomorrow. So thank you for your time. So next, please, uh, Professor Liu. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. Professor Mary Ling and uh, Professor Otani. We move on to our second session. I would like to call upon uh, Professor Mansuri. Uh, to introduce our second speaker, Professor. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to introduce our next speaker. Um, and the topic will be uh, diffuse gliomas in the molecular era. Uh, I think this is a very salient topic. Uh, on the one hand, we're excited about finally recognizing these tumors for their molecular behaviors. We know that um, they definitely have a different uh, behavior and response to treatment. And it kind of get gets... Uh, rid of the numerous different histological classes that we had, but at the same time, it creates a challenge for us in terms of, okay, how do we manage these now clinically? Is there survival of these molecular GBMs any different than histological GBMs? How do we stratify patients into, mole into uh, clinical trials? So I'm very much looking forward to uh, our talk today and uh, looking forward to the conversation after. Thanks so much for for Professor Masuli's introductions, and uh, nice to meet you, uh, Professor Liu Busen. And uh, I'm Dr. Ji uh, Fengxi from Huashan Hospital and uh, Shanghai, China. Today, my topic is the molecular biomarkers in adult diffuse gliomas from diagnosis to surgical navigations. So, uh, firstly, I want to uh, emphasize that my topic today is a focus on the adult diffuse gliomas. Uh, as you know, that glioma is a very heterogeneous disease. That, uh, for example, the pediatric tumors uh, or the infratentorial gliomas, brainstem midline gliomas are quite different. So today I focus on the uh, uh, supertentorial adult diffuse gliomas. So I have nothing to disclose. So first, we can see some numbers that in China that bring malignancy, the annual growth of rate of brain malignancy is rising. So now it's ranking number one in the world. We can see that the incidence of brain malignancy and the death number is quite uh, bigger. So it's a big challenge for us to treat brain malignancies. Uh, as we know that for some, uh, for the brain malignancies, the most of the, the brain, uh, malignant brain tumor, and uh, we call mainly the, the gliomas. So gliomas is a very difficult topic. And we can see from this um, the timelines that in the 1926, the first glioma resection, and now is 2023. In about 100 years period, that we do not do a very good good jobs to treat gliomas. We can see that the patient survive, overall survival 
time of the glioma patients, especially the GBN, that improves a little bit. Uh, but, uh, but I'm not so disappointed about this because I always hold the belief that with the uh, technology de development that we can use some new technologies to conquer the tumor and to improve the, the overall survival of the glioma patients, especially the GBM patients. So our department, uh, Huaten Hospital Neurosurgical Department is one of the biggest uh, neurosurgical department in China, and uh, we performed uh, a glioma surgery that in 1950s, and uh, this is the first glioma surgeries in the People's Republic of China, and that is the astrocytoma grade twos. So now time moving to the 2021, uh, 2021 and with the WHO on um, criteria uh, came out and uh, we see that the histology diagnosis of glioma uh, is not so accurate because the uh, living uh, the clinical outcome of uh, glioma patients based on histology diagnosis then varies a lot. So um, that means that with more molecular biomarkers involved into the diagnosis of glioma, we can see that the patient survivor uh, will, uh, will we, we can very uh, have a very good prediction of patients' clinical outcomes. And uh, in the WHO 2021, there are three types of uh, adult diffuse gliomas. That is, one is uh, GBM uh, IDH wild type GBM. Uh, it's it is the worst. Uh, clinical uh, worse, it has the worst survival uh, uh, result. And the second is the IDH mutant astrocytoma. And uh, the third is the IDH mutant and the 1P19 cube code deleted oligodendroglioma. And as we know, that the oligodendroglioma with IDH mutant and the 1P19 cube code deleted, this kind of patient have a very good survival time, and they have a very good 10-year uh, survival rate. But only these biomarkers is not enough, because as we all know that the gliomas is a highly genetic heterogeneous tumors, and uh, uh, one molecular biomarker cannot actually precisely to tell what kind of tumor it is. So we need more biomarkers to precisely diagnose the gliomas. So this is one of the uh, research con conducted by my department and the uh, uh, pathology department in Hong Kong. And we use several biomarkers, that is TERT, IDH, BRAF, 1P19Q, EGFR, 10Q, and H3. By using these six biomarkers, we can stratified all the gliomas into six molecular subgroups. And we can see each molecular subgroups has its own clinical outcomes. And uh, from our perspective, that our molecular stratification system is better than WHO uh, uh, gradings. As we can see for WHO grade uh, three tumor, uh, if we have, if it is belongs to molecular group one, it also has a better uh, clinical survival time than WHO grade two, molecular grade six. And this kind of results can also be saw, seen in WHO grade four, molecular group four patients and the WHO grade two, molecular group six patients. So that's why we should involve as many as single biomarkers to in the diagnosis of gliomas because more uh, biomarkers, which means that we will have a more precise diagnosis. But sometimes uh, uh, the, the number is one, uh, one aspect. The other, we should notice some un unusual uh, mutational uh, spots of uh, single molecular biomarkers. As, the, as we know that the IDH1 and IDH2 are the most common mutations in gliomas. Actually, in the clinical practice, we often see that IDH1 mutation occurred on R132H. Uh, so this is the most common uh, 
uh, subtype of IDH mutation we have seen in the clinical cases. But actually, we have some unusual uh, IDH mutation subtypes. So what kind of differences between these two uh, kind of mutation sites? So this is a very interesting paper paper in the 2021 published on active neuroprosological, we can see that uh, the patients diagnosed with the uh, usual IDH mutation R132H, they have not good clinical outcome than patients bearing uh, non R132H mutation of IDH. So that is a very interesting uh, result. It teach us a lesson that we should interpret pret the, the biomarkers in our glioma patients very, very carefully. And uh, it needs a large case uh, study from the multi centers to improve the clinical significance of one clinical biomarkers. However, that uh, as we, uh, we can see that for the single biomarker is still not enough so uh, we should transfer uh, so in, uh, in that about 200, 2016 and 2018 that the Hutton Nosmere from the USA, they uh, have raised out a concept of the G GCIMP subtype of gliomas. And uh, IDH mutant tumors often leads to a specific supergroups that called GCIMP positives. But this is a qualified definition. And the GCIMP can also be uh, co-entitified into GCIMP uh, high and the GCIMP low. And we can see the picture from the right side. If the tumor is the GCIMP high, after the treatment, uh, when the tumor recurs, it becomes the GCIMP low which means that the previous treatment regimen is not suitable for the recurrent tumors. But if it is still uh, present with GCIMP high expressions, that means we can also use the former treatment regimen to re-challenge this kind of recurrent tumors. So what is the concept of the GCIMP? It is based on the DNA methylation uh, status. So if we, uh, when we uh, talk about the, the DNA methylation in the glioma diagnosis, we sh should refer to this uh, classical papers, which published on Nature in 2018, as, as is uh, the paper from the Kepper. So, in uh, yeah, also from the DKFC Germans, and by using the methylation uh, uh, sequencing and uh, all the gliomas can be reclassified according to their uh, methylational uh, status. It is more precise diagnosis to tell us what kind of glioma it is. So we also use this kind of diagnostic tools to diagnose some uh, unique or unusual uh, type of gliomas. For example, uh, triple negative GBMs. Actually, we know that the GBM will have the IDH Y type 1P19Q uh, non codilated and the third mutation, that's the classic GBM. If the, the third mutation is not existed, also third Y type, so we call it the, the triple negative GBM. So, what kind of tumor it is, we don't know according to WHO 2021. So, we should use the methylation uh, diagnosis systems and that we can see for this inside this kind of uh, gliomas, there are three uh, subtypes which called the classical like, and this is the, the, the classic GBM. And the second is the LG M6 GBM is quite uh, a good uh, clinical prognosis. And the third is the mesenchymal like GBM. It has a more uh, most uh, malignant glioma uh, GBM subtypes. So the methylation classifier will tell us some unusual uh, glioma subtypes, what kind of tumor it is. Also, that this is a paper published by the Hutton Nosmere. He also used this kind of uh, DNA methylation array to do some uh, liquid biopsies. And we can see 
that for some uh, primary tumors that the, the, it, it, it is established uh, established a, a methylation uh, assay that's called the GLEB1. So for kind of uh, primary tumors that we can see that the methylation uh, level is higher, but if the tu uh, after tumor reception, the methylation level will uh, decrease to normal tissues. But when tumor recurred, the methylation level will re-rise. So it's a very good tool to help us to pre-diagnose uh, the recurrent gliomerosis. So we have a lot of uh, diagnostic um, technologies, but for our neurosurgeons, uh, what, uh, uh, how can these biomarkers help us to treat glioma patients? Just like we have the fire, then how can we use it? So uh, we put our eye on the role of moleculars to guide our molecular surgery. So uh, as we all know that for glioma patient, especially for GB, not only for GBN, but for LGGs, the extent of tumor resection is directly correlated with patient's clinical outcomes. More EOR means that the patient can live longer. And uh, from the uh, literature published uh, up to now, we can see if we, according to different uh, MR uh, navigation, uh, uh, navig navigation to delineate the extent of resections that uh, we can have different clinical outcomes. For example, for IDH wild type glio glioblastoma patients, we should only resect the contrast enhanced tumor. And uh, it, it's not uh, obligatory to resect the tumor uh, on non-contrast enhanced tumors because uh, the resection um, of the maximal resection of non-contrast enhanced tumor does not mean that patient can live longer than if you only resected the contrast enhanced tumors. But for IDH mutant astrocyte tumors, that uh, if you, you do the maximal resection of non-contrast enhanced tumors, that means patients can live longer and have uh, uh, and benefit a lot from your strategy of tumor resections. The third that is about the oligodendrogliomas. For this kind of tumors that uh, sometimes it, uh, it's located in the insular lobes and it is more difficult to achieve complete resections. But when you uh, are doing this kind of surgeries, you should know that from the paper uh, that partial or the subtotal resections that means there is no differences uh, in the clinical outcomes, uh, then you, you do the gross total resections. So that means you can dance with the tumor, uh, not without the tumors. So all these published paper tell us that our surgery has, come in, uh, has been coming into the molecular pathology arrows. So uh, we also do uh, uh, research about uh, what kind of the, the surgical uh, strategy for the IDH wild time LGGs. So we uh, do this uh, studies in our own departments and uh, we have in included 106 patients. All these patients have their molecular diagnosis and, uh, and uh, have the extent of right, the record of the extent of uh, uh, right. So from the result, we can see for the IDH wild type LGGs, that um, the, the percentage of uh, extent of the resection, uh, the more of EOR means that the good uh, clinical outcome that will be, and we separate it into three subgroups that the EOR are 100 and 80 to 19, 99, 19.9 and uh, lower than 18. And we can see that is yes, quite closely uh, correlated with the patient clinical survival. And uh, the meanwhile, also we can subtype the, the uh, classified the patients into two subgroups, which is the EOR 100% and which is, the other is the EOR less than 100 spurted. That we can also see that uh, the patient 
with EUR 100% has a very good clinical outcomes than uh, its con uh, counterpart. And we also calculate the resident tumor volumes and we uh, classify this patient into uh, four subgroups, which is the uh, zero uh, residual tumors. And the RC is 1.0.1 to 5.0 cubic centimeters. And the third is the 5.1 to 15. And the fourth is more than 15. And we can see that for IDHR type LGGs, the, uh, the, 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 the residue tumor volume is also correlated with the, the survival period. Less residue tumors means that patients can live longer. So as come to the conclusions for IDH wild type LGGs, we should try to do maximum safe resection of tumor and make the residue tumor volume as small as we can. That will do good to this kind of clinical, uh, to this kind of patients. And we also uh, do a threshold and uh, we can see for the IDH wild type uh, LGG patients, if the resection percentage more than 96-100% and uh, both with the resident tumor less than 4 point cubic centimeters, this kind of patient, if, you, if the neurosurgeon uh, reach that criteria, you can have the patient benefit a lot from the surgical resections. So um, we can see that uh, the molecular biomarkers has a very good, uh, uh, will tell us a lot of information and guide us how to resect the tumors. But actually in the reality world, we also face one question that how can we use molecular biomarker to delineate the tumor boundaries and guide surgical resection? Uh, because uh, the, the previous studies is a prospective study, a, retros a retrospective studies. And in the, re uh, the real uh, OR room, we should uh, uh, develop some uh, techniques to navigate our molecular surgical resections. So this is a glioma uh, cases. We can see there are different layers of gliomas. That is the cold layers and the the paratumor layers, and the third is the uh, edema layers. So how can we see these three layers uh, by our own eyes and decide it, how, how much tumor we should have recepted? So that's why we need some new technologies. And we also uh, develop some new technologies in our own department and groups. So the first strategy we carried out is to use IDH to be a target. Uh, we can see that, uh, that for the uh, IDH mutant patients, they also have a high level of 2-HG expressions. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a classic knowledge that uh, for the neural colleges. So we used this kind of uh, uh, phenomenon to uh, design IDH to be a molecular biomarker to delineate our glioma uh, bound, uh, molecular boundaries. So we develop uh, a promotography mass spectrum uh, technologies to rapid diagnosis of uh, two HG levels. And the firstly, we can see in IDH mutants uh, tumors that the two HG level is higher by using our uh, these technologies. But for the IDH uh, wild type tumors, that two HG level is very low. So secondly, we also develop our small uh, mini beta, we call the GCMS detectors. So we use this kind of machine to detect, to evaluate the two HG uh, levels and uh, to uh, make the, the, the diagnosis, what kind of tumor it is. So we can see from these cases, the first time we choose, uh, we, we got a sample from very superficial part and uh, the frozen histology showed it as gliosis, not gliomas. But when we use the GCMS detector, it shows the two HG as high expressions. So 
we do the tumor resection and uh, have another biopsies in the not so superficial areas as something some, somewhere deeper. And the second frozen pathology is the biomers. And uh, the 2HD expression level is much higher. And that means that to use GCMS to detect the 2HD level will help us to, uh, to tell us that what kind of tumor is, if it is a glioma or not, and uh, if we have uh, close to the boundary of the gliomers with IDH mutants. So we do some more uh, studies on, on, on the tumors. So this is a, le a left insular lobe gliomers. And from the MRI, we can see it is a typical IDH mutant uh, LGG patient. And uh, we have used these GCMS technologies to detect the boundary of the gliomers. And we can see if uh, when we reach the real boundary of the tumors, that the two HG levels will be lower. And that tells us that you have reached the boundary of tumor and you can got total tumor resections. That's our strategy for IDH mutant glioma patients. But what about the IDH wild type gliomers? So if it is wild type, we cannot detect 2HG, so we need to transfer to another biomarkers. Then we choose the pH level to be our molecular navigators. And you can see from these pictures, if it is the tumor, the pH level will be more lower. It means it is more acid. But if it is normal tissues, the pH level will be higher. It means it is non-acid. So from this uh, pers uh, perspective, we develop our SERS navigation system interoperatively delineate the exceeded margins. And the firstly, we did some uh, animal model uh, experiments and uh, we uh, have plunged a tumor into the uh, the rat brains, and uh, we do the tumor resections. Uh, when we uh, we do it step by step and the resect tumor uh, a little by little, when we uh, reach uh, the, the 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 boundary of the tumors, we can see the exit part is uh, is decreasing, and uh, we also uh, choose the the. The, the tissues from the tumor boundaries then do the frozen sections. And from the HNE pictures, we can see uh, there is almost no uh, tumor uh, cells that on the HNE HN uh, standing slices. So uh, this, the, uh, we also to evaluate uh, the tumor resection rate uh, with uh, the, the, the survival time uh, on the rat animal mode. And we can see by using our this kind of technology, uh, we can have a very good tumor resection, then uh, guard uh, guided surgeries. And if uh, the tumor is totally resected, that means this kind of animal can live longer. So finally, uh, we uh, transfer this kind of technology into clinical uh, applications. So this is a female uh, patient. It's a very young patient, only 30 years old. It suffered from the sudden seizure attack once, two months ago. And uh, from the CT, we can see there is a tumor located in the right frontal lobe. And then we also see some calcification inside the tumors. So it uh, indicated maybe oligodendroglioma, yes. So for this kind of tumor, our strategy is the maximal resection of the right frontal lobes. It, it means that we need to resect the tumor along its molecular boundaries, not only on the image boundaries. So this is the MR pictures and confirm our diagnosis. So we set up uh, 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 we set up this machine in the OR room, and uh, when we do the tumor resection, we take out the tissues and do the uh, exit uh, level detection to uh, def to define whether we have reached the boundary of the tumors. 
So from these pictures, uh, we can see uh, there is uh, three layers on these uh, tumor tissues. The first, the number one tissue, it is the, uh, the, the tumor, it is the pure tumor. And the, the number two tissues is, is the, uh, the boundary of the tumor. And the, the number three tissue, it is the normal tissues, uh, brain tissues. So uh, we use this exit uh, navigation uh, that we can uh, very clearly to define the, the molecular boundary of the tumors. And also uh, from the prosology levels, we can see our strategy is part uh, right uh, in, uh, in, in terms of the glioma boundary uh, delineations. So this is the post-operative MRI scans and uh, we can see the tumor has got near total receptions and it is SSI tumor uh, grade threes uh, not as we thought that the, the, the oligodendrogliomas. So finally, uh, conclude my talk, talks. The first day, I, I want to say that because a glioma is a very difficult in brain diseases, it's not the treatment of glioma not only depends on your surgeons, it, only, it depends on your pathologists, neuro-oncologists, but for our neurosurgeons, we should have as much more uh, as knowledge about the neuro-oncology and the neuropathologists, not uh, only know how to do the, the tumor resections. And the second, uh, second point is that uh, from now on, we can see that our uh, glioma surgery has in, entered into the uh, molecular errors. We should use molecular biomarkers to 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 uh, to to to, uh, to, to uh, help us how to decide to decide uh, what kind of the surgical strategy we should have. And uh, furthermore we can use some molecular uh, biomarkers to be uh, uh, visualized uh, molecular navigator to help us to delineate the glioma's boundaries and uh, help us to resect the tumor uh, totally on the molecular levels, which means that patients may have benefited the most in our glioma uh, surgical resections. So that's uh, thanks to all my uh, colleagues and uh, my partners from uh, Fudan Universities and the uh, CUHKs. And uh, that's all for my talks. And I would like to see the, hear the comments uh, or any questions from the audience and the moderators. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shi. That was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, definitely innovative, trying to push the boundaries of what we're doing so far. Um, I have a few questions, but uh, I'll wait to see if there's anyone in the audience who has questions. Um, I don't see any hands up. So maybe I'll just go to my questions. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's too late right. uh, in the Asia time. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I appreciate it. Go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I really like your idea of a more integrated biomarker strategy, including a BRAF mutation, et cetera. Um, at your center, what method do you use to establish these biomarkers? Was, it, was I correct in understanding that you use the DNA methylation strategy or do you use NGS? What do you use to establish that? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, in my uh, hospitals, uh, usually we use the NGS uh, technologies to do the diagnosis because the methylation classifier uh, technology is quite complicated and uh, mm. it is not uh, only about the uh, sequencing technologies it is about if you get the DNA uh, information and if you, if you have the sequencing data you need to upload, upload this data to the DKFZ uh, website yeah. And then get the diagnosis. As maybe it's uh, quite uh, not so acceptable for our hospitals. So actually, we use NGS. But for some uh, unusual case or rare case, we will or we cannot have a very uh, clear diagnosis. Or maybe we can try that methylation classifier. Absolutely. And what is the turnaround time? Because that's one of the major challenges for uh, many centers. Uh, yes, uh, for us, our turnaround time may be uh, 10 days. Oh, wow. That's, that's great. And um, do, do you have the situation in China where like 
Um, many hospitals at the periphery are also doing glioblastoma surgery or glioma surgery, or do, do patients come to these quaternary central hubs? Because if not, like, what, what do they do? What do the peripheral sites do in terms of their molecular diagnosis? Yeah, it's a very good question because, you know, we have a lot of hospitals in China. Uh, actually, uh, a large part of uh, glioma patients will go to a big uh, neurosurgical centers like us. But sometimes, uh, because uh, maybe for some re reasons, like uh, the, the patient is very far away from uh, like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, so they can only do this uh, treatment in their local place. And also for sometimes if the glioma with the, uh, the hemorrhage and uh, uh, some, some very big gliomas which make the brain pressures high for some patients, they will choose to do the surgery in local hospital. But uh, if we met this kind of con conditions, <laughs> I think that uh, it, it's very hard for them to have the medical diagnosis. But we have a very good connection uh, network of uh, MDTs for if they, they, they can do the surgery in local hospitals, but when they have the prosology a diagnosis and they have a, uh, they can come out and uh, to have the, to see the, the MDT, uh, to enjoy the MDT service in our uh, centers. And we can uh, guide them how to uh, have the treatment after surgeries. That's our mm -hmm. experiences. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, you talked about the G-SIMP evolution with these tumors, especially with uh, some of the conventional chemotherapeutic treatments we have probably accelerates that. And a recent Nature paper came out as a review, but by a big group of neuro-oncologists, neurosurgeons, about the need of uh, frequent tissue acquisition in brain tumors, kind of like an analogous to other cancers. That's how we've made headway, frequent tissue analysis. Um what are your thoughts on that? How feasible is that? And um, yeah, the value of it, obviously, <laughs> we know there's value, but how feasible is that? <laughs> yes, I, I uh, sorry, I, I don't have a lot of comments because I remember that maybe uh, 10 <laughs> years ago, the first time I, I, I visit a hosp hospital in German, uh, uh, maybe Dosseldorf, and uh, they, they do that surgery is like uh, the, the, the strategy, like you said. Oh, I'm sorry, it's my alarm. And uh, every time they take a little uh, biopsy from the tumor and uh, tell patients how to do next step, after the treatment, then record the patient to the hospital and do another biopsies. So I was amazing about this kind of strategy and that times. Uh, I know it is a very good uh, 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 in terms of the pre precise medicines, <laughs> it's a good example, but actually in the reality world, uh, we don't do that. Patients cannot accept that in China. Yeah. Right. And that was basically, I was trying to lead up to my next question, basically. <laughs> um, what, what, what do you see the value of liquid biopsy as an alternative to this? Are we there yet? Um, are patients going to probably more likely to take that up, you know? Uh, yes, uh, I think that the liquid biopsy is uh, is the future. Uh, for example, for some uh, midline gliomas, maybe like some uh, portine uh, DIPG or the uh, thalamus or uh, gliomas, sometimes it is unsurgical. Uh, and, and we, we cannot do the, the, the operation. And it also sometimes it is very uh, dangerous if we do the biopsies. Uh, so we can use the liquid biopsies to uh, make the diagnosis. It's very important. And the, the second uh, point is, uh, if we have very good liquid biopsy technologies, we can know whether the patient is got recurrent or not before there is some change on the images. That's very important. Yep. We can treat this kind of patients as early as we can. I think it may delay the recurrence or the malignant transformation for, uh, for, for glioma patients. That's my only uh, perspective. Yeah. I, I agree. Do, do you see it being blood or CSF or both? <laughs> yes. Actually, there is a lot of papers that uh, say they can do liquid biopsy from the blood. 
But to be honest, I'm not proud to believe in that <laughs> because it's very <laughs> hard. <laughs> But for yeah. for the C CSF, I think it is uh, quite uh, uh, reasonable. And uh, for example, uh, I think for example for some uh, uh, the brainstem gliomas, sometimes we will do the uh, Omaya implantation. To treat the hydrocephalus, and we can got the CSF,、uh, and we can do the liquid biopsy, and I think it is feasible. I agree. I agree. Thank you.、Um, just want to pause. Nobody else has a question. <laughs> Going. <laughs> yes, everybody、um, has this weekend. Yeah.、Um, so you mentioned the pH meter. I think it's a really、um, not meter,、uh, but I think it's a very cool idea. Um, what is the depth of penetration of that? Like, is it like half a millimeter, one millimeter? You know what I mean? Like, you're resecting more and more. If you see it as an intraoperative use, was it an intraoperative use or is a preoperative、uh, imaging based thing? No,、oh, yes, it's the intraoperative use. Intraoperative. So, what is the depth of penetration of it? You know what I mean? Like, how often do you have to keep using it? You know what I mean? Uh, so you 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 mean that、uh, our pH technology? Right. So, for example, you reach this boundary. You're not sure if it's tumor or real、uh, normal brain, and you want to apply your pH me、uh, measuring probe, right? Yes. Yeah.、Uh, what it, is it reflecting? A millimeter deeper? Five、oh, millimeters、okay. deeper? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah.、Uh, actually, uh, uh, it cannot、uh, penetrate so、uh, so deep. It can only、okay. scan the surface. Uh, okay. Can only see this. So if we want to know what、uh, what happens deeper, we should、uh, to resect more tumors and got got samples from deep site. Right, and I imagine hemorrhage affects it too. So you have to have a really clean site, right? Like if there's <laughs> blood on top. No, if there's like a drop of blood on top of the what you're sampling, it probably can affect that, right? Yes, you 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 accept. So absolutely right. So we need to counter the bleeding and try to choose some samples that without the the the, the blood on on that. So it's sometimes it is very counter of conflict because uh so we choose if we choose the patients to do this、uh, kind of detection, we often choose that the the tumor located in the non eloquent areas, and so that we can do the maximal tumor resections. So, in、mm -hmm. for some eloquent located tumors, it is hard to achieve. Okay. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Really. Thanks so much. That was great. <laughs> I really. Okay. Enjoyed, I really enjoyed、Thanks. it. Thank、okay. you so much. Thank you, Doctor Masali.、Uh, so, Joel, Sam, you you want to ask a question? Hello. Yes. Yeah.、Uh, thanks, Prof. Zifeng.、Uh, Very, very, very comprehensive、uh, lecture. Uh, um, just wanted to comment and ask your opinion regarding the latest WHO guidelines. Yeah, molecular markers are fantastic, and heard that your turnaround time is ten days. That's really wonderful. But、uh, what is your advice in、uh, countries in which the turnaround time can sometimes be one month, two months? And、uh, would you advise?、Uh, These countries or、uh, these centers in which、uh, it takes such a long time to actually adhere to the guidelines provided, because I think、um, many pathologists as well as the、uh, oncologists are reluctant、uh, because they are afraid of medical legal consequences if they don't follow the latest guidelines. What is your comment on this? Thanks. <laughs> yes,、uh, I don't know how how. How to how to answer your questions? But for me, I think that uh, uh, molecular uh, diagnosis is、uh, not feasible for all the patients in、uh, all the hospitals around the world, because as we know that the、mm, there is a lot of molecular findings on gliomas that maybe we can see the papers published on TCGA, published on the Randberg, published on DKFCs, but finally. Only a very small of、uh, amount of molecular biomarkers came came into the WHO diagnosis criteria. That means that we can only do what we can do, and we cannot、uh, ask for something that we cannot do. So it depends on on、uh, the the 
the real conditions of different uh, countries and different hospitals. But for me, I think that uh, to, to the medical diagnosis is very important. Uh, if you cannot uh, have a very rapid diagnosis, then you can have it one month later, two months later, it's okay. For, for one example is that if, if you can read the uh, New England papers 2023 that about the IDH uh, inhibitors, it's uh, clinical trials, that we can see a very good uh, result of IDH inhibitors to treat IDH mutant tumors. But if you don't do the medical diagnosis, you will never know whether this kind of patient is IDH mutant or not. That means you missed the chance to enjoy, to have the IDH inhibitor treatments. So that's my uh, personal comment. Thank you. Really, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Prof, I have one question for you, Prof. Uh, you show, show us a, a comparison study be, between your pH mapping and also GEDO enhanced uh, MR uh, resection. Uh, do you foresee that uh, you will do a study, a comparison with your pH uh, mapping uh, with uh, 5 ALA, for example, or so called a new technique, uh, contrast enhanced uh, ultrasound, uh, which gives you a real time uh, uh, contrast enhanced imaging, Professor? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Liu. And that's a very great question. Uh, but but you, have, uh, you came to our department and you know there is uh, no five other in China. <laughs> and okay. uh, we, we can, we, we, we once we try some cases, but we, uh, the five other is not allowed in, in, in China mainland. So we cannot do this kind of surgeries. Uh, but you are very good, uh, very good ideas, maybe in the future, we can carry out some uh, multi-center clinical trials to, to do some research workers. That's a very good idea. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, is Professor Mansouri is still here? Can we hear your uh, concluding uh, comment, Professor? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, having tuned in. Thank you, Dr. Shi, for this excellent talk. I think uh, having the myriad of options available out there and uh, sorry, um, it, it's a great option to have. And I look forward to the clinical trial options and just pushing the envelope when it comes to this terrible disease. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, okay. Thank you to, to Professor Zinfen again. And, and we're going to conclude our uh, session today on behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Kato. I would like to thank both speaker of today, Professor Tosi, Tosi. Uh, Meilin and Professor Shi Zifeng, as well as the Chair, Professor Nakoi uh, Otani and Professor Ali Reza Mansori for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I also would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And so again, until we meet again on the 5th of August, it's bye-bye from all of us and thank you for joining. <music>